question. Actually, I, I guess I was more annoying than you. Because I was very frustrated, you know, like you guys know how it is to learn code programming nonstop for a couple of months and debug. Nobody told me when I started to code that it's more about debugging than actually making things work. <laughs> um, so I know it's late afternoon and you've been hearing people talk uh, for the whole past days. And before I start to tell you about my work, uh, I'm still fine, by the way. Nice to meet you. Um, I wanted to do a quick exercise um, because I'm going to talk a lot about kids and play. And I think that playing is like riding a bicycle. Like we never forget to do it, we just need to remember. So we're gonna do like a very quick energizer where you stand up and you're gonna play rock, paper, scissors with the person next to you, okay? And I can put some music to help you get in the mood. Okay, you guys, you guys know how rock, paper, scissors works, right? I actually built it, but like when I was like young, I didn't have 
complex as Google's technology is. Like, I learned much later in life. Um, and constantly, you know, as I got the opportunity to go to programs like Singularity University or NASA campus, to MIT, to you name it, I was always thinking, like, oh my god, if I would have learned about robots, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, when I was like six, imagine all the things that I would have done by now, right? So when I started academia, I really thought about this. I thought that if we can translate some of our biggest ideas and biggest problems and biggest, you know, like questions in terms of technology in ways in which kids can understand and not only understand but actually create with, um, then we are really preparing them for the future and that's what education should be about, right? Uh, that's what a 21st century education should be about. So, one of my first workshops, this is in 2000, I'm going to date myself now, this is in 2015 uh, in Berlin, one of the first academia workshops, she is 2014. And this girl, can you guys guess how old she is? Can I get some more? Four, eight, eight five, five more? Six. Seven. She's six. Yes, she's six. Um, but I like that you guys think she's four. Yeah, I guess you can't really tell from here. Um, and what is she doing? Can you guys tell what is she doing? She's soldering. Do we allow six years old to solder in an old school? Why not? Because they can burn themselves. Okay, they can burn themselves with a stove at home as well, right? Like, and then, of course, you know, like, we say these things because they were told to us, like maybe our teachers or our parents said the same things, like, oh, that's dangerous for you, or you shouldn't do this because I didn't do it when I was your age. So it's like very interesting that the same people that are trying to change educational systems and the way we learn are people who are products of a certain system, right? So they don't always question it. So I can tell you that a six years old can solder with no problems without burning herself, right? Moreover, she spent she was doing this TV Be Gone project. I don't know if you guys know it from Mitch Hoffman. It's like an open hardware project where you can make a universal uh, remote control and turn off any screen. Okay. So our dream was to build a lot of these with kids and turn off all the TVs <laughs> secretly. Um, she spent three and a half hours soldering her universal remote control and her parents were terrified. Like they were looking at her, they were looking at me. Um, she didn't want to take a break, she didn't want water, she was like in the flow, in the zone. And two days later, her dad calls me like, Stefania, where can I find a soldering iron? Like my daughter would not stop talking about this. And I think it's really important to, to mention this. On one hand, because I think kids can do much more than we give them credit for. And two part, because I think that if we constantly protect them and try to kind of you know, domestify and like really dumb down everything that we explain to them or give them access to, we're not really preparing them for the future. Um, and moreover, like, I don't know if you guys know, but today it's International Women's Day, yeah? And I think it's very important to not only give kids access to these things, but actually encourage little girls and women to get their hands on and try dangerous things. Right? So that's what I made my life mission to be about. And I think, you know, after having worked with kids in literally more than 40 countries and taking like, you don't need to necessarily have like expensive sensors or, yes, if you have an Arduino is cool, but in certain places you can't even afford that. We actually had, this was the first Maker Fair in Nigeria, in Lagos, 2012. And this kid built this, this crane entirely from recycled materials. And he was using syringes and had like a super complex mechanism for, for controlling the crane. And then, moreover, like it's not just about the kids, we invite the parents in as well. Because there's only as much as we can do in as part of our workshops or as part of our programs. It's actually super important for parents to pick this up and continue it at home. And pay attention to what their kids are passionate about, right? And ask questions. So, my experience in working with parents has been uh, diverse, like in terms of having like really helicopter parents who are like, okay, you do this, he's not learning enough, you should try this. Or having parents who are like super laid back and just want to drop their kids at a workshop and come back and pick them up. Um, so like we really like have different strategies to, to really bring people in. And you guys are in tech, so if you probably will have kids someday or already have kids and go with a work, to a workshop in your 
you know, your children, you will not be so terrified of like learning how to make a game with your kid or programming a robot. But for people who are not in tech, it's actually up to us to design tools and activities and programs to actually bring them in as well. Because I believe coding and machine learning is part of, it's, it's a new literacy. So even if you don't work in tech, you still need to know a little bit about it. And actually training the kids, it's a great way of training the families and the parents as well. So yeah, so based on, after doing all these things, like um, I, I was working, doing workshops, training people to start their own workshops, everything we do is open source, it's online. Um, I reached a point where I realized this is how much what I can do, what I did can grow in a grassroots way. And I should also say that we had like the Robin Hood business model where when kids could afford to pay for workshops, they would. And that would allow us to give scholarship and free access for the kids that couldn't. Um, so after doing all of this work, I decided that I, it's time for me also to go back to school. So I really wanted to go to Media Lab, which is this like, how many of you have heard about MIT Media Lab? Okay, a handful. Okay, I'll explain what it is. So MIT Media Lab has been created 32 years ago uh, as part of MIT. And it was the first interdisciplinary like research center of MIT. So people that do music and people that do robotics and people who do prosthetics would all be in the same place and work with each other. It was created by Nicolas Negroporti, uh, Simon Popper, Marvin Misty, and lots of other amazing, amazing researchers. I knew I wanted to go here, but I knew these people only accept students that have crazy ideas but can also implement them. So the reason I went to Flatiron and actually applied for a scholarship to be able to go to Flatiron is because I knew I need to become a much better developer, like full stack, so I can show that if I have an idea or a research question, I can very quickly implement it um, and translate my ideas into prototypes, because otherwise I wouldn't get accepted. So we, it was all part of a really big long-term plan, uh, which somehow, like crazy, it worked. Um, I should also say, this is part of the conversation I had with some of you yesterday, that, you know, uh, I, it took me a very long time just to decide to apply because as a woman, I always thought that I need to learn so many things and be so prepared and have all these credentials before I can apply. And it turns out that these people actually, like the lab I work with, knew of my work with the kids from before and were like, why didn't you apply earlier? Like, and, and it took me so long because I was like, I need to learn this, I need to prepare this, I need to do this project. Um, so my advice for the, for the woman in the room, always apply, uh, even if you're not ready, even if you don't think you're going to get in, like there's nothing to lose, always apply. You're going to learn a lot in the process and, and I think very often we hold ourselves uh, up to very high standards and it, it doesn't always work to our advantage. So when I joined, I joined this group and the name it exemplifies directly what the group does. So the group is called Lifelong Kindergarten, and uh, it's the same group that created Scratch. How many of you have heard about Scratch? Yeah, so Scratch is like the largest online community for kids to learn how to code. It's more than 10 million kids. It's translated in 50 plus languages, and it's a group of lovely people, like extremely passionate and dedicated people who really care about creative learning for kids. So the, the core, like uh, credo of this group is uh, from uh, Professor Mitchell Resnick, who runs the group. It's what he calls the four P's. So the four P's stand for projects, passion, play, and peers. And I think you know this applies for the kids in this in Scratch, but it also applies for what you do in training school or for anyone who wants to learn um, how to learn, uh, how we, and in general how to grow. Right. So we learn best when we do a project, project-based learning. And we learn best when we're working on things that we're passionate about, right? And we learn best, like we did earlier, when it's fun, because if it's not fun, then we're not gonna spend a lot of time doing it. And we're social animals. No matter how much technology we're putting into our lives, we're always gonna need people and peers and communities. So whenever like, I'm deciding what I'm gonna be working on or how to design a project for my work, I'm always going back to this, right? We have like this focus on projects, project-based learning, does it allow people to be playful and passionate about what they do? And does it allow for a community to grow, right? And for peers to learn from each other. So 
yeah, that's that, that was like what was at the base of Scratch. This is how Scratch looks like. This is how it's growing. Actually, they just launched it for their, their uh, latest 3.0. And I'm going to let some kids explain to you how Scratch works. I was searching for interactive programming language on the internet, and I came across Scratch. As soon as I shared my first project, I got instant feedback, and I was like, okay, I want to continue with this. I remember my first project. It's a super simple animation. I'm still actually really proud of my first project. It opened my eyes to the different possibilities that coding can present. So I've been drawing basically since preschool when I learned how to hold a crayon. I think making art with Scratch is different because I can collaborate with other people, make something interactive that other people can use. There was a song that said, happy, happy birthday. I put Scratch in there. It just became an instant hit on the site. and inspired so many people to make their own songs and remixes. Anyone can do anything with my product. And sometimes it's really funny how they change things at the end. It just goes to show like how much you can actually do with all the things you have from scratch. When you're looking at other people's projects, you're engaging on such a different level, uh, which really encourages this kind of mindset of seeing yourself and each other as makers of things and not just consumers. I never thought that I could do like the coding part. Like I thought like that was when I was grown up and I hired someone to code it for me, but then I was like, hey, I can actually do this myself. It gets more complex. But once you know the basics, you can add on to your knowledge and move at your own pace. If you like solving problems, if you like drawing, if you like making music, if you're into anything, Scratchy is for you. Yeah, it's open source and it's online, and I know what a lot of you are thinking. It's like, this is blocks, it's not real coding. Um, what I'm going to tell you is that it is real coding. And Actually, a lot of these kids, like you saw, and this goes back to the, the previous presentation about designers versus programmers. And you could see how it has, it provides many pathways for people who are into music, for people who love drawings, for, to actually get into code. And I actually use Scratch also to teach teenagers. I was a teacher for girls who code. Um, and I like it because when you get people started, they don't get stuck because they missed the semicolon. And they can operate with concepts. They can understand what a loop is. They can understand what a function is. They can understand what are the computational thinking like primitives and operate with them. And then, of course, once they get something working and it's fun, they're going to switch to like Python, JavaScript, you name it. And a lot of these kids did. But it does provide a accessible like low floors, like an accessible ways for people to get into it and not get intimidated. And if you actually want to see like insane programs that people are doing with Scratch, I highly encourage you to go to the website and just search things like OCR. And you're going to see like entire al algorithms. Oh, Wi-Fi is too slow. Um, but yeah, if we if we type here like OCR, people implemented like entire al algorithms to detect like written text or written numbers in Scratch. Um, or if you just search AI insane amount of games and very complex programs that were created. So don't underestimate like how how complex the high ceilings of, of, of this platform and see it more as a first step for people who want to get into, into coding. So yeah, this is a neural network for recognizing handwritten numbers implemented in Scratch. Um, and if internet was a bit faster, I would actually show you how it works, but it's online. So you can try it. Um, so yeah, so I, I worked with this team and basically they were preparing to move away from Flash because Flash is dying and go to Node and that would allow them to also be accessible on mobile devices and be responsive and it also allowed them to make a lot of connection to physical world which is my first love because I started hardware. So well, this is another project that came from the, from the team. How many of you have heard of Make Makey? Okay, I have to show this video. It's too much fun. Is it a video? Um, yeah, so there's this banana piano. Oh, I guess it's not there. So yeah, Make It Make It allows you anything that is conductive, like banana or wet paper or aluminum foil to become pop, like an input for your computer. So you can ma map any conductive object to a key and then do things like I don't know, uh, we made a musical room where every single object would be making a different sound 
Um, you can make games where you are jumping in the real world and a character like Mario would jump in the game. Um, so it really allows to connect the digital to the physical. And there are many other extensions like this that allow people to basically see the world as a construction kit, right? Anything that has an API or anything that has a firmware can be mapped and connected to any, to any web application. So one of the first things I did was take Spotify, make an extension for that, and then have five robots that are dancing to any song from Spotify. So um, these are like a, a list. If you go to scratchx.org, you're going to see like a ton of extensions from Arduino to the International Space Station Tracker to Leap Motion. So these are like just like building blocks that kids can put together and make projects. And what does this have to do with AI? Well, it turns out that almost half of households in the US have a voice assistant, right? And these devices were not necessarily designed for kids, but kids end up using them. And it completely shifts everything we know about child development. If a four-year-old can get on the web via voice, like that four-year-old doesn't need to read and write even, right? He can just ask any question to Alexa or Google Home and get an answer. Um, and what if that four-year-old asks about God, if God exists? Or what if that four-year-old asks like very tricky questions, like what is love? Or you know, a, a real problem right now is that a lot of kids are actually doing their math homework with Alexa, <laughs> right? Um, so, so you know, like this is a thing. It's a thing, and this is like the first generation that is like, of kids that is actually growing up with AI. So seeing this, I was like really thinking like, can I actually like create extensions to allow kids to teach Alexa and program Alexa and not only use Alexa? And not only Alexa, I, I actually came across like other devices. How, how many of you know what this creepy doll is? <laughs> Have you heard it, about it or seen it before? So this creepy doll is called my friend Kayla, and it's uh, Bluetooth connected. It's one of the many IoT toys. It has a Bluetooth connection, and it turns out that you know, in the rush of trying to get to kids with smart toys, companies didn't put a lot of effort into the security of these devices. So this doll got hacked the moment it got put on the market in Germany, and it's kind of like the baby monitor is being hacked. So like. A random guy would just like talk through the doors <laughs> to your child, right? Um, not scary at all. And basically, in Europe, this doll is banned. So the European Union made regulation that said, like, look, if you don't have like a secure connection, if you're not in conformance like with GDPR and other things, you cannot sell this doll in Europe. However, you can still get it on Amazon for twenty nine dollars. Um, this thing, it's called Aristotle, and this was Mattel. Mattel is one of the biggest like toy manufacturing company, and they dedicated an entire team. They put so many resources and effort to launch this Alexa for kids, Aristotle, which also had a camera. They were planning to launch it for Christmas, and it turns out that they didn't think about actually asking the parents like if they would be okay with this device, like actually recording what their kids are doing all the time with the camera, um, or do any research and see like how this could be misused or like what impact it would have. So they just were like, they announced it, right? And 15,000 parents signed a petition against it saying like, we do not want to have this in, in our nursing, you know, uh, room. like we do not want to have this in our kids' life. So they had to pull it down from like, uh, they had to cancel the launch for this product. So this gets to show that while you know companies are rushing to launch these products for kids, and while things like Alexa and others are already in the homes and being used by kids, we have very, very little understanding of how <coughs> are kids actually using these things? How are they perceiving them? How can we do it right? Um, so I started to look into it, and this was like the first extension I built. Um, let's see, there's a video. So, this is like an open source robot. Um, it's using Raspberry Pi and the parts that are 3D printed, uh, the parts that are holding the servos in place. And you can teach it by demonstration. So you can teach it how to draw, and then it tries to do it too. And sometimes it makes mistakes. Um, and it gets more and more complicated, right? So um, you can also teach it to, to react to different like, UI code, 
clouds and program different animations into it, like make it act happy, make it act like a dog, um, make it act sad. Um, you can also, let me see if I can speed up through the video, teach it how to collaborate with other robots, um, how to throw balls. This is kids' favorite activity. Um, yeah, but this like really kind of sets the tone differently. It's like you're teaching the robot, you're demonstrating things to the robot, then the robot plays with you and, you know, um, and, and it can get more complicated. You can teach it to play rock, paper, scissors with you and so on. So we actually did a study where we invited 26 families to the lab, to Media Lab, and had different stations. Like each station would have a different device, like Alexa or the Akila doll or Cosmo, uh, Chatbox, Google Home. And then the kids and the parents play with these devices. And then after that, we ask them questions. Is it smart? Is it smarter than you? Do you trust it? Is it friendly? Because we just wanted to understand how the kids perceive these devices, right? And how do they play with them? And what questions do they ask? And um, yeah, I can show you a quick video to see, to see how this went. Also, the age range was quite wide. So, how can they play? Most of the kids that were older said that uh, Alexa and the smart toys were smarter than they were. Uh, Alexa, what's this dinosaur? Alexa. Oh, dinosaurs are I think she's not. Okay, she's doing it. That's what she said, yeah, she's not. She's going to videos of mice solving mazes, and then having to teleoperate Cosmo 
through a Lego maze and trying to, to solve the maze. And every single time they would watch the videos, we would ask them how smart was the robot, how smart was the maid, uh, the mouse, how smart were they at hello operating. And the reason we pick this task is because it's very clear to see success when it's a maze, if it's solved or not. So it's easier to determine it that way. And the best thing is that we actually ask the parents to do it as well. Uh, I love this picture because it's like a small chair. And, uh, <laughs> but they took part of, in the study separately. So we invited the kids, and then the kids went out of the room, and then the parents came in, and they didn't get to talk to each other. And what was very interesting is, like, first of all, I want to share something that really shocked me. Like, a lot of the younger kids thought the mouse was a robot. So I had a lot of kids that were, and bear in mind, this was done in Boston, in greater Boston area population. So I think those kids are more exposed to technologies than other parts of the world. However, it was still surprising to me that a lot of the four years old and five years old had more experience, like they probably knew four or five types of robots, but they never played with animals. Um, and they thought the mouse in the video was a robot. So that was, that was interesting. And then the other thing that was interesting is that even if these kids had coding experience before or technology experience be before, what impacted their decisions or who's smarter and the way they were describing it was actually the way their parents were talking about it. So parental attitudes and even words like explanations would carry on to their kids, even if they did the study separately, right? So we would see pairs where the parents would say, yeah, the robot is stupid because it was programmed. So someone gave the instructions and the kid would say the same thing. Or we would see another pair of a child and a parent where the parent would say, oh yeah, the robot is smart because it was programmed so it can detect like colors and edges and learn, and the kids would say the same thing. So here we see two things. One, that kids are actually mirroring parental like mental models and the way they talk about these things, but also that we need new terms because right now when you have a robot or a system that can learn through machine learning, we are still saying it's programmed, right? And that's not really like the same thing as in the case where I'm just sending some instructions to the robot and the robot is only going to do that. So we actually need to come up with new terms because if we do not have the terms, we are not able to develop understanding of how these things are working. Um, and yeah, like our study actually showed that the younger kids didn't hear their parents as much. So the older the kids would come, the uh, get, the more they would actually not only choose the same things as their parents, but also talk in the same way. And yeah, I think, I think it's, it's, it's very important. This gets to show why it's important to start early in, in introducing kids to these things, but also why it's important to train not only the kids, but also the parents. Um, last, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm sharing a, quite a bit of research with you, but this is the last reference, I promise. Um, remember the creepy doll, right? Kayla. We actually did another study. Have you guys heard about the marshmallow challenge? Yeah. yeah? So we tried to do the marshmallow challenge type of study, but with the doll. So we actually had kids coming in, playing the game with the doll. We had three conditions. One where there was a doll, one there were, where we had this called human confederate, so basically a graduate student, and one control condition where there was nobody. And kids would watch videos that would have animations and uh, statements, like is it okay or not okay to stand when everyone is sitting? Or is it okay or not okay to hit another child? There was like a picture with someone hitting with a pillow. Uh, or it, and the, these were questions that are standard questionnaires that were used before to test conformity and moral values. And after they would watch the, the videos and answer the questions, they would play a game, and then they would go back and watch the videos and ask the questions again, only that this time the doll would try to make the kids change their mind. Right? So the doll would say, I think it's okay. I think it's not okay. So it would try to persuade them one way or another, and same with a human confederate. And in the control, there was no uh, intervention, but we just wanted to see if the kids would change their mind. So what we saw is that actually, when it came to moral questions, like is it okay or not okay to feed another child, the doll had a bigger influence in changing kids' minds than the human confederate, right? So granted, he's a graduate student, which was a, an adult, uh, if it was a child, I'm curious how the results would be different, and we're actually replicating, like we're continuing this study, this was a pilot study. 
But still, like it gets to show that you know these devices do have an influence on kids and can have an influence on kids. And actually, like very recently, there was another study published in Nature um, that showed that robots can have peer pressure, can exert peer pressure on kids. So if a child is in a group of robots and they're looking, I don't know if you know this optical illusion, like which line is longer, and the robots can convince the kids to pick the wrong line. <laughs> so this gets to show why it's important, like this is especially for parents, like it's like why is it important for kids to learn about machine learning? Well, we do want them to have the critical understanding of what's normal for Alexa to say, what's normal for Adobe to say. Um, yeah, it, it, is it okay for this device to actually tell me this or ask me this? So we want them to have this critical approach, a critical understanding. And moreover, we really want connected families to not look like this, right? How many of you have traveled on a plane and see like an entire family, everyone in front of their devices, or even at home? And we want connected families to look more like this, where we're actually like, where we have parents and kids learning together. So based on all these different studies, and there's many more that I didn't get a chance to share, and based on a lot of discussions and interviews with parents and kids, we build this platform called Cognitates, which is building on top of Scratch that kids are already familiar with. And the, the purpose of this platform is to enable kids and parents to learn about machine learning and AI by playing it by doing. So before I tell you a little bit more about it, I want to show you a video of kids presenting it for themselves. Oops. So, when we were programming robots, you could play rock and scissors. You did rock, paper, scissors into the camera, and I'll shoot you did one of the motions, and the camera did one of the motions, and it's like rock, paper, scissors, shoot. The computer gets like better as you play the game, because like that, we might not know everything at first, but if we keep trying, we get better. Everyone has heard about like machine-based learning or artificial intelligence, and there's sort of no questions to ask for a lot of more tech savvy. Parents are like, go for it. Technology is going to be a huge part of their lives, much more so than my life. If it's scary for some people, it's AI and technology. I totally get it. But as a parent and as a teacher, I thought it was really important because these are skills that 21st century kids need to have. When my dad was young, he bought a car and took a bike to see how it worked. So we teach people that young how these things that grown up mostly program how it works. So yeah, so kids that are seven years old think that AI are like AI is the car of their generation. And basically the platform is online, it's open source, you guys can play with it today. You can contribute to it, you can make extensions. Um, and I, it has a lot of extensions, like anything from a Muse headband that allows you to control robots with your mind, to like sentiment analysis on text, uh, to training your own classifiers for text or vision. I prepared a lot of demos, but I'm running out of time. Uh, so here's, here's the website. The code lab is where you can use the blocks, and the DJI is where you can train your own classifiers. So we made one that can recognize doodles, for example. So this is very quickly put together. Uh, it's a classifier that was done with 100 classes from the quick draw data set. So you guys can tell me what to draw. I'm a terrible person at drawing, so this is going to be fun. Banana. Banana. Okay, I'm going to start with banana. <laughs> and then I see a line, diving board, syringe. Okay, let's try again. Uh, I don't know if I can make a better banana. Come on. I guess like this. Do this. Uh, okay. I'll try an umbrella because I, I know how to make that. <laughs> and then, let's see. The internet is slow, but it usually, this is, you see, it sees umbrella first. And, um, but what we want to do is actually keep adding their own drawings and training their own. Um, so they can do that already, like for 
for vision and for text. Um, so if I go, this is one that is already trained, but I just wanted to show you how you can quickly train your own. So if I, we need to get a free API key. For this one, we're using Clarify. So if I make one that is like cats versus dogs, I'm going to delete it. Um, let me just do a new one. And it works pretty fast when you have good connections. So I'm going to say I want to have cats, and I want to have dogs, and then I'm going to add examples of cats, and I can add multiple. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Let's see, I had this once, and then it's going to show me, oh, it already exists. And then I'm also trying to add all sorts of examples to confuse it, like a cat that looks like a dog, or a cat that looks like a fruit. And anyway, once I have 10 examples for each, I can go to my project and teach it. And that would actually give me a model that I can use in any project I want. So if I go to my code lab, uh, then I can use that model. I'm sorry for the internet connection. Um, let's try, well, this is loading. Let's try with this one because I already preloaded it. So for example, this one, I train the model to recognize when they say happy things and sad things and backhand. Um, and, this, and this was something that kids came up with, right? I didn't even know that backhanded compliments exist. So, so, so the dog is waiting, and if I say something like good, oh, he thinks it's backhanded, that's right. Bad boy, bad boy. Oh, come on. You are a bad dog, very bad. Our training set. But you kind of got the gist. Like, you add your own examples, you create a classifier, and then you can make rock, paper, scissors, or any animation you want. But this is a much more fun way for kids to actually learn how machine learning works. It makes it much more interactive. And yeah, uh, to wrap it up, because I definitely want to have time for one or two questions, um, I just wanted to say, like, that this was designed with kids and for kids. So anything from the characters design, to the text that we put on the blocks, to the interface for this, everything was done with kids. And what we see, going back to my initial like point, after we did long-term studies, like six weeks going to schools every single day, to like public schools, private schools, community centers, like really across the board in terms of socioeconomical status and also experience with coding, what we see across the board is that kids actually change their opinions. So they don't say that, you know, Alexa or the robot is smarter than they are once we show them how to program them, once we show them how to train them. Um, so it definitely has an effect and it demystifies this. And we also see that I've done this around the world, so not only in the US, the different cultures are more skeptical than others. Like you can see here in Berlin, the most skeptical kids in terms of intelligence attribution <laughs> or in terms of like how much it tells the truth. Um, so yeah, I ran out of question of time, but like I should say that this is not uh, is not only my work. It's also this is my team. Um, most of my colleagues are still undergrads and they started working on this at 19. So if you think you're a junior developer and you cannot have a big impact, think again. Um, and yeah, we're always looking for people to help. We have a ton of bugs and a ton of things that we want to make better. Um, our code is online. I'm also going to tweet these links if you don't have time to write them down now. So definitely help us make it better if you can. Uh, or just tell us what's broken, a lot of things are broken. And um, yeah, and I'm also teaching a class for graduate students. So we also want to promote, like not only criticize what exists, but actually create alternatives. So what's going to be the Lego of AI? So I'm teaching this class, the syllabus is online if you're curious. Um, it's Hacking Smart Boys, I'm teaching it both at ITP at NYU and at BC. So I definitely had that situation where ITP students were more like creative coders were like, you are teaching the BC? Do those people know how to code? And then I'm like, yes, they know how to code. And then the people at BC is like, oh, you're teaching at ITP? Do they know how to design? And, and, and now they're all working together. It's awesome. Um, but yeah, I definitely <laughs> I definitely think it's important to do this kind of work in guerrilla coding and deployment and research and bring it all together. 
because I we want to prepare our kids for the future. Um, and I hope you guys can help with that. And thanks for your attention. Hey, uh, my name is Erin. Um, you talked about how children would mirror the language of their parents. And I'm curious if you think there are healthy ways for parents to talk about intelligent technology with their kids. Absolutely. Thank you for, for the question. Um, I think a lot of the times like parents should be just honest when they don't know how it works and try to show kids how they would look, look it up and learn together. And same applies for teachers. Like I think we're way past that stage where the teacher or the parent is the beholder of knowledge. Um, and it's very likely that the kids will learn much faster and find the answer much faster, but we still need the parents and the teachers to be there as facilitators and guide, you know, like, you've, I don't know if you guys seen, there's this moment challenge on WhatsApp that like causes suicides of teenagers all over like South America. And these are situations in which we see clearly that Young adults and you know, like kids don't know the limits or what is normal for technology to ask of you or do or not. And that's really where we want parents and teachers to be in the loop. Um, so I, in, in my thesis, which is also online, and I didn't get a chance to present everything, I actually showed like lots of excerpts from interviews and what are ways in which we try to take a term, a very complicated term like neural network, and what are the words that we would use to, to talk about it with kids. Um, and I think it's hard for parents that feel overwhelmed themselves, but I think if it's being approached like, hey, this is something we're figuring out together, right? Uh, or this is a decision we're making together. Should we put this in the home or not? Like, for example, Alexa speaks German now. Nobody puts it in the home in German, right? Because they are like, we do not know what data is being collected, who is it being shared with, and what effect this has on the kids. So we're not gonna put it in the home, even if they give it, give it to us for free, which is why what is happening, that's why you have so many echoes in the homes. Like they're pretty much given for free. Even if it's given to us for free and it's convenient or whatever, it's cool. Like we're not going to put it in the home until we figure it out. And I think that's a much more healthy approach. Hey, I'm Josh. I have, um, I have a son who isn't old enough to read or like program yet. Uh, and I'm curious if there's anything like, um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that like, reading with your kids will like encourage a love of reading or something like that. Is there anything that you've seen, um, things that parents could do with kids but who aren't able to read yet uh, that might be able to start in, like um, encouraging like a, a, a curiosity or uh, an excitement around uh, this type of stuff? Yeah, there's, uh, thanks for your question, Josh. Um, so I'm, my focus group, age group is like seven to 14, uh, but I did work with younger kids and a great resource is Alison Gopnik who talks about the gardener and the carpenter and different parenting styles and why we want to be more like gardeners and not carpenters. Um, so one big thing for very young kids is like just being present and paying attention to them. Um, there's actually like, this is quite sad, but there's like lots of recent studies that show that kids learn how to speak later because parents put their smartphones so much so they don't see their parents when they're talking to as much, right? It's, it's crazy. Like, so we're at a stage where we need robots and phones and Alexa's to actually bring kids and parents back together to learn how to play together, to learn how to do storytelling. Like all these things that we grew up with that are kind of like being uh, affected by current use of technology, right? So that's one thing. And I would also say that, you know, like, I think I had a big advantage of getting bored when I grew up. And growing up in the middle of nowhere was very helpful in that way because I got to like be in the nature a lot and read a lot and learn, you know, like uh, learn how to get bored and have my imagination develop through that. I would also encourage you to give your child time to be a child, right? A lot of doctors in the US prescribe play because kids are so overbooked that, uh, you know, they get depressed and then the doctor ha actually has to prescribe play for kids. And it's like, that's kind of insane. So with my students, I didn't get a chance to share this, but with the students that are designing now for kids, you know, they would make this, one of the students wanted to make like a game for like, um, for the play, like playing grounds for kids. So they wanted to do like a kit that is like a playground. I'm like, why would you do a kit? Like, let the kids go outside, go to the real playground, go and observe how they play, 
And maybe you add something that makes sounds when you're using it, or it amplifies what you're already doing, but we do want to encourage kids to still do a lot of physical activity, go outside, not be in front of screens all day long. Um, and I think the fact that Cotton Mates and Scratch and all these things can work on a mobile is going to help a lot, because there are lots of games that I can do with the phone and, what, and train it, like recommend my gestures or what I'm running and collect that data. Or, but like merge it much more with things that still allow kids to go outside and play. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> um, and very quickly, this is I wanted to show you guys how simple the code is. So this is all like JavaScript. So the extension that is the sentiment extension. Um, this is basically how many lines? 101 lines of code. Um, and this is taking like a pre-train fairly complicated library that allows to do sentiment analysis on text and just creating a couple of blocks that allows kids to very quickly play it, take it in, and make games with it. So in the beginning here, we're just like defining what's going to be on the block, like when the text is negative, when it's neutral, give me the feeling of the text. And then here I just have like my JavaScript functions that are making a call to the library and say, give me the score for this text. If it's above this number, it's positive. If it's below, it's negative. So this is one of the most simple extensions we've made. Of course, it can get more complicated. But yeah, if you have like a Sphero or any other like weird model that you want to use or anything that you would love to make an extension for, um, highly encourage you to have a look at this. Thank you. Thanks.